Former Congressman and author Paul Findlay of Illinois has submitted the following remarks to be presented today. June 8th, 1967 will live as a day of infamy. It will be engraved indelibly when the American people confront the awful events that day. There's something happening here but What it is ain't exactly clear The Israelis and the Egyptians were going to war and we were sent to the Med to uh, listen. So well, during the day, the only thing there really was to do was go out and sunbathe. Even the captain was out sunbathing. Really nothing else to do. You just cruise along real slow and you listen to everything you can hear. And boy, they slaughtered the people out there. And I could see uh, in the distance, you could see the shoreline. And you could see smoke and that. You knew they were had a fighting over there. But then I saw that boxcar everybody's talking about fly over. And Fine boxcar, they call them that. It was right here. I'm coming out of the main spaces. I'm going back to the shed where this thing is. I look over and here's this flying boxcar deck level. Not more than 50, 100 feet from us. They're waving, we're waving. It's really. Yeah, Waved at these Israeli pilots and, you know, like there was nothing to it, you know. Okay, you're all right. I went back down to work. Uh, for me, it sounded like somebody threw a handful of ball bearings on a, on a piece of glass and they stuck. To me, it sounded like somebody threw a big handful of big rocks. What it was. These jets came in and they were unmarked. Went right on by, made a U, came in, and they started shooting. You should have seen the front. There was just devastation everywhere. Just everything was burned, shot holes everywhere. The one thing that struck me most was the forecastle. The forecastle was a high part in the front part of the ship, and we had two gun tubs up there with 50 caliber machine guns on it. We had people in the gun mounts because we were at a ready situation. And uh, those kids were killed right away. I mean, when they came through the first time, there was two down here, and two guns up there, just a little 50 calibers. They couldn't even hurt those guys and those jets. They couldn't even move it that fast. But they were just killed. One of the guys was a gunner's mate. He ran up there, he was mad. He wanted to kill those people. And he got into the gun tub and they just blew him apart. Those of us that were down below decks are pretty well thought it was the Arabs that were doing it. And I thought, Lord, if I'm gonna spend the next five years in an Arab prison, I want something to read. And I had a little pocket New Testament down there. So I went and got that pocket New Testament, stuck it in my pocket and got my spare pair of glasses. And, uh, they said, well, you need to get up to the radio room that's on the side that they're not attacking. Because they shot all our antennas. Each single missile would go into those tubes and find those hot wires from the transmitters and suck it right in there and blow it up. So we didn't have any communication. Then one of my guys went out, climbed up, and you know, everybody's shooting. And he ran a long wire, and we got a message. Firefox, Firefox, this is Rock Star, Rock Star. Under attack by unidentified surface and naval air units require immediate assistance. And they wanted to know some code and the radio man pretty much told them they weren't going to get a code, but if they wanted to listen to what was going on, feel free. We didn't see any assistance at all from the American government, from our own government, from our own Sixth Fleet that we, we were told there was 15 minutes away mm -hmm. until 16, 18 hours later. For the first time in history, our Commander-in-Chief demanded that U.S. forces abandon a mission to rescue a nearby U.S. Navy vessel, then under heavy deliberate attack by hostile military forces. The vessel was the USS Liberty, and the U.S. Commander-in-Chief was Lyndon Johnson. The hostile forces were Israeli. We had a Marine 
I don't know if you talked to him or not, Bryce Lockwood. Can you see the farm eyes? We had three Marines we picked up in Rota. They were linguists. Two of them were killed immediately. But that Marine came up, he went back, he brought somebody up. God damn it, I got you this far. I'm going to let you get away now. <laughs> and one of the sailors was down there helping him, and he got one of the guys out too that were hurt, but they couldn't get to where they. And then we closed it. So we had no way of getting off except these three cork life rafts. And I remember there was just a few minutes of space of time and I heard this engine revving up. And then I heard machine gun fire. And I didn't find out until afterwards that it was the Israelis and they were machine gunning those life rafts to make sure we couldn't get off. Israel claimed it was an accident, yet I know from personal conversations with the late Admiral Kidd President of the Court of Inquiry, that President Johnson and Secretary of Defense McNamara ordered him to report that the attack was a case of mistaken identity. This unforgivable, inexcusable cover-up has haunted us for 40 years. What are the implications for our nation's security, not to mention our ability to honestly broker peace in the Middle East? when we cannot openly discuss Israeli actions which result in the deaths and wounding of 200 Americans. That whole front part of the ship was red, running with blood. And I looked up and the flag was flying. In the midst of all this devastation, blood, human body parts lying over the place. And the only thing I could remember was that the rockets, red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gate through through the night. The flag was still there. 